Um, okay, so who was Ibn Wushia? Uh, the simple answer is that Abu Bakr Ahmad Ibn Ali Ibn Wushia was a 10th century scholar and translator from rural Iraq with extensive knowledge in Aramaic or Syriac, um, and specifically Aramaic or Syriac to Arabic translation, uh, especially in regards to agricultural, toxicological, and what we might today call anthropological or ethnographical matters. Uh, why he's important to our purposes? Well, throughout his voluminous writings, he touched on and preserved many pagan beliefs and practices from late antique rural Mesopotamia, though he himself was admittedly neither a pagan or a magician. Uh, so apart from what little we can gather from his authentic writings, namely those contained in his book, The Nabataean Agriculture, uh, very little is reliably known about Ibn Wushi, probably on account of his rural background, as the Finnish historian Yako Hamin Antilla noted, he was not deemed worthy of an article in any of the biographical dictionaries, which admittedly typically focused on religious scholars and poets in urban centers like Baghdad. Uh, what we do know is that Ibn Wushia claimed himself to have translated the sources gathered together in the Nabataean agriculture and he did so as a means to celebrate and preserve the old ways of Chaldean civilization as it had existed before the arrival of the conquering Arabs some two centuries earlier. Uh, he was born into an Aramaic or Syriac speaking family, Syriac being a dialect of Aramaic. And despite being a devout Muslim, Ibn Wushia spent much of his life rather disillusioned with Arabic culture when he viewed it in comparison with the great Mesopotamian civilizations that preceded it. Uh, while they were indeed the bringers of Islam, he saw the Arabs as little more than barbarous invaders from the south whose cultural customs were eroding the glorious achievements of the ancient Mesopotamians. So Ibn Wushia was inspired to translate the Nabataean agriculture from Syriac into Arabic by a number of factors, uh, specifically this idea of Asibiya, uh, or national spirit, which coincided with a broader movement in the 10th century that opposed the special privilege that Arabs had within the community of Islam. Though this movement also coincided with uh, another widespread movement that placed tremendous value on translating texts of all kinds into Arabic, especially from Greek and Syria. So this was a great way for educated men to make a living. Uh, you take a valuable book from Greek or Syriac, you translate it into Arabic for a local notable, you sell your copy, lather, rinse, repeat. Uh, what, what's significant for our purposes here is that numerous texts from the work compiled by Ibn Wushia played a vital role in the astromagical tradition we all know and love today via the Arabic Gayat al-Hakim, and later through the Latin Picatrix, a text which I'm sure needs no introduction among this audience. Um, in the Latin Picatrix, uh, that is in the tradition to have circulated around Christian Europe, Ibn Wushia appeared in a handful of different spellings. So we have Aben Vazia, Abu, uh, Abu Dair Aben Miaxie, these are almost like unpronounceable, uh, Aben Razia, Aben Waxia and Abu Ba'r Aben Vaxia. So certainly some medieval readers may not even have realized or cared that all of these different names referred to one single author, but uh, much of this kind of ambiguity would have been dispelled when they saw that these names were tied over and over to a book called variously the Chaldean Agriculture or the Nabataean Agriculture, which was clearly a major source for the author of the Picatrix. Now, bears mentioning right out the gate that one thing we do know is that Ibn Wushia did not condone magic and probably would be rolling in his grave if he knew how the Picatrix made selective use of his work. Um, as a devout Muslim, Ibn Wushia was not himself interested in going native, to use a dated expression from the history of anthropology. Uh, he didn't study his ancestors to try and recreate their activities. So to get an uh, example of Ibn Wushia's anti-magical bias, 
we can turn to one of many passages in the Nabataean agriculture written by his own hand rather than translated. So the following excerpt is connected to a passage featuring a talisman for protecting date palms, and it was passed down by Sabiatha the magician. In it, Ibn Washia can be seen expressing regrets that his work might seem too weighted toward talismanic magic in content. Here's what he wrote. I regret having narrated some of the talismans of the magicians for things which I have mentioned in this book. My regret comes from two reasons. First of all, when people get accustomed to using talismans and magic, it will be harmful for their soul. Secondly, I do not want anyone to think that I would regard the use of magic and magical talismans as permissible. For this reason, I must say here that I forbid magic and magical talismans because they always work for harm, not good. We also forbid causing injury to animals, let alone people, the best as well as the worst. This is my doctrine. I only mention in this book the magical talismans and other actions of the magicians when they benefit the plants upon which the life of people is based. Nothing is more beneficial to them than plants. This benefit, which is the opposite of harm and is permissible for me to mention here, or rather this is a benefit, Nay, I even deserve a reward from people because I am eager to benefit them. My dislike for magic and my regret for having mentioned it is caused by my fear that people will get accustomed to using it or that they think that I would consider it in general permissible and not forbid it. So you can cue the Curb Your Enthusiasm theme song in your head if you'd like. <laughs> this, is, this is definitely not something you would assume from just reading the Picatrix um, and the numerous extracts from the Nabataean agriculture contained in it. So what this means then is that we ought to better get better acquainted with the Nabataean agriculture itself if we want to understand both the Picatrix and Ibn Washia more clearly. Now, just so nobody accuses me of cherry picking from a single passage, I'll show you some other passages where Ibn Washia casts doubt on magic but I also want to give you a sense of how he seems to, at times, contradict himself on the issue. In the first quote, he says, Myrtle may also, like other plants, be used to repel magic, according to some magicians. The science of magic, the ilm as is something which, with which I do not concern myself, and I do not like to speak of what I do not know. Uh, so that's fairly respectable, but Note, however, that this curiously contradicts what Ibn Washia says in another part of the text. He says, if this book, The Nabataean Agriculture, were a book on talismans and magic, I would discuss this in depth, but that would take us away from agriculture. But I have written a book specifically on magic in which I discuss this theme and others more profoundly. If someone wants to know this, let him read my book on it. Now we shall return to agriculture. So. How do we reconcile these discrepancies? Um, I haven't the faintest clue. I'm simply aware that they exist in the text. Uh, it's always possible that Ibn Washia didn't despise magic as much as he said he did and was trying to throw people off his trail. But if that's the case, why can he be found wavering on the issue in the text? Why, why would he come out and say that he has a book on magic when earlier he said he doesn't like to speak on what he doesn't know? In any case, I don't have any answers on this. All I can do is point to what the text says. So, uh, the Nabataean agriculture is an extensive work spanning over 150 chapters of various lengths. These chapters deal with everything from olive and fruit tree cultivation to irrigation, waterworks, the digging of wells, the growing of plants, the management of estates, weather forecasting, planting times, months and seasons, the stars, the influence of different winds, types of soil, types of grain, and how to cultivate them, all the way to wine and bread making. Despite this agronomic focus, Ibn Washia also wove his material together with anecdotes pertaining to all manner of magical and mythological folklore that he considered significant. And much of this constituted the material that wound up in our beloved Picatrix. So while the sources which constituted the Nabataean agriculture were late antique rather than ancient Babylonian, 
That is, they were from the 4th century AD onward, not from the 16th century BC, as some Orientalists believe throughout the 19th century. Uh, nevertheless, to the medieval author of the Gayat al-Hakim, or the Picatrix, the text was certainly thought to contain materials stretching back many millennia. Uh, the text's constituent sources were translated by Ibn Washiya around 903 AD, and it sold itself as a compendium of ancient sciences from the indigenous pre-Arabic rural peoples of Mesopotamia. Yako Hamin Antilla, the author of an authoritative treatment of the Nabataean agriculture's history called The Last Pagans of Iraq, has argued convincingly for a rural northern Mesopotamian origin to many of the work's constituent sources. He demonstrated that its Babylonian, Assyrian, and Byzantine materials in particular uh, had to have first passed through a Syriac or Aramaic rendition, that is, Nabataean renditions, before Ibn Rushia translated them into Arabic and dictated them to a disciple. So, Long before any knowledge of the Nabataean agriculture reached the Latin West in the 13th century of our era, the text first gained much of its popularity in Egypt in the immediate wake of Ibn Wushia's lifetime. That there still exist at least 40 manuscripts in addition to numerous works containing excerpts and summaries of it attests to its overall significance. It was possibly in Egypt that the Picatrix's author encountered Ibn Wushia's text, copied parts of it, and returned them to Andalusia, where he wove them together with excerpts from over 220 other books to create the Gayat al-Hakim, or the Goal of the Sage. The 12th century Sephardi philosopher and rabbi Moses Maimonides gave a fairly extensive refutation of the Nabataean agriculture in his Guide for the Perplexed, which suggests it was being read, and some of its content were even being put into practice in some Jewish circles at the time. You know, why would Maimonides have to spill so much ink over this book if it wasn't a problem for him and his community? Uh, we'll come back to this. So, from the mid-10th mid century onwards, the 900s, the work was read from Egypt to Andalusia alongside such text as the Epistles of the Brethren of Purity, the corpus of literature attributed to Jabir ibn Hayyan and the pseudo-Aristotelian Hermetica, so the uh, Kitabs al-Istimachis, al-Istamatis, al-Ustuotas, al-Maritis, and al-Haditus. Uh, this combination of texts, when taken together, presumably played some role in coloring the Nabataean agriculture's reception. When it comes to the magical material in the Nabataean agriculture, it's true that there is much overlap in theme and content with so-called hermetic material, but probably on account of his own particular nationalist sentiments, Ibn Washia stood firmly rooted in the Chaldean or Kasdanian tradition, not the Haranian, Sabian, Greco-Egyptian, what have you, Mandean traditions. Later authors would bundle them together to some extent, but Ibn Washia himself insisted that they were historically distinct traditions. To him, 90% of the world's knowledge could be traced back to his ancestors and 10% to everyone else. He says as much in his intro to the book on poisons. Lastly, as you might have guessed from the previous slide, while some of the Nabataean agriculture discussed philosophy, magic, astrology, these were not its central subjects. First and foremost, Ibn Washia was concerned with ancient agriculture and the general increase of life-bearing fertility throughout native lands. So, is it the Nabataean or the Chaldean agriculture? Uh, the Latin Picatrix uses both titles interchangeably, as well as referring to the sages of both the Chaldei and the Neptini in the Latin. So, the original Arabic is Al-Filaha al nabatiya the Nabataeans are, that's an Arabic label for rural Syriac speaking people who inhabited a region around modern Iraq or Mesopotamia. It's a much, much looser definition than what most modern people think of when they think of the Nabataeans who built the city of Petra uh, in Jordan. Even Armenians are sometimes called Nabataeans. So this is a very extensive label. And then for the word Chaldean, this is related to the word Kasdanian, and that means Babylonian. 
So who were the Nabataeans? Jaco Heminantilla gives us a few important bits of historical context to keep in mind when dealing with Ibn Wishia's text. The Nabataeans, to use an Arabic term, were peasants. And even though their families had lived in the areas from time immemorial, they had, to a great extent, lost the continuous remembrance which could have extended back to the Assyrian and Babylonian empires. This was not an unprecedented phenomenon in the area. The Persians had keen knowledge of their ancestors and moreover a long tradition of historical writing, yet they too had almost complete ignorance of a major part of their own history, which tends to jump from the Achaemenids to Alexander the Great to the Sasanians, not only glossing over the foreign Hellenistic rulers, the Seleucids, but also most of the Parthian Arsacids. So this is a point that needs to be stressed he here again, uh, since it's something Hamie and Antilla stressed. Given that there was no real unbroken lineage of wisdom going back thousands of years for Ibn Wishia to tap into, his work was really comprised of a wide, vari wide variety of agronomical material dating back to late antiquity, not the Bronze Age. Uh, now, in spite of this rupture rather than continuity, Hamin Antilla tells us that magic, while generally abhorred by the author, is still a source of national pride for the Nabataeans, who are magicians par excellence. By comparison, even the Yemenites seem less professional, and the claim of the Canaanites to various kinds of magic are shown to be vain in comparison to the inventions of the Kazdanians. Also, the Copts in Egypt have their share of magic, but even in their accomplishments are not comparable to the Nabataean magic and the art of their talismans. So from this, we can get a sense as to why there's so much magical material in the Nabataean agriculture, in spite of Ibn Wishia's general distaste for magic. It was a source of national pride, and his book had nationalistic aspirations. So, as already mentioned, by the 12th century, the Nabataean agriculture enjoyed enough popularity in Egypt so as to fall across the eyes of the great rabbi and rationalist philosopher Moses Maimonides aka the Rambam. Uh, he wrote a fairly substantial attack against it in his famous Guide for the Perplexed, sec or Book 3, Section 29 and 30. Despite being a book about agriculture, Maimonides dismissed it as a book about the actions of talismans and practices with a view to causing spirits to descend, demons and ghouls living in the desert. Uh, so, now, I, I, I have a few slides on Maimonides because I want to give a kind of sense of how the Nabataean agriculture was being received in Egypt in the 12th century. So keep in mind, this is a very narrow perspective that comes from, uh, from a specifically Jewish perspective. So this isn't uh, a Christian or an Islamic or a Mandean or a Haranian perspective. This is just one of the few discussions of this book that survives for us. So, this is what Maimonides says. It is the object and center of the whole law to abolish idolatry and utterly uproot it, and to overthrow the opinion that any of the stars could interfere for good or evil in human matters, because it leads to the worship of the stars. It was therefore necessary to slay all witches as being undoubtedly idolaters, now the witches believed that they produced a certain result by their witchcraft, that they were able, through the above mentioned actions, to drive such dangerous animals as lions, serpents and the like out of the cities, and to remove various kinds of damage from the products of the earth. Thus they imagine that they are able by certain acts to prevent hail from coming down, and by certain other acts to kill the worms in the vineyards, whereby the latter are protected from injury. In fact, the killing of worms in vineyards and other superstitions mentioned in the Nabataean agriculture are fully described by the Sabaeans. They likewise imagine that they know certain acts by which they can prevent the dropping of leaves from the trees and the untimely falling of their fruit. On account of these ideas, the law declares in the words of the covenant as follows. The same idolatry and superstitious performances which you which in your belief you keep certain misfortunes far from you will cause those very misfortunes to befall you. 
I will also send wild beasts among you, Leviticus 26, 22. I will also send the teeth of wild beasts among them, upon them rather, and the poison of those that creep in dust, Deuteronomy 32, 24. The fruit of thy land and all thy labors shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up. Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but shalt neither drink the wine nor gather the grapes, etc. Thou shalt have olive trees all throughout thy coast, but thou shalt not anoint thyself with oil. In short, in spite of the schemes of idolaters to support and firmly establish their doctrine and to make people believe that idolatry, certain that by idolatry certain misfortunes could be averted and certain benefits gained, worship of idols will, on the contrary, prevent the advantages and bring the troubles. The reader will now understand why, of all kinds of curses and blessings, those mentioned in the words of the covenant have been selected by the law and particularly pointed out, in order that we may keep far from all kinds of witchcraft we are warned not to adopt any of the practices of the idolaters, such as are connected with agriculture, the keeping of cattle, and similar work. The law prohibits everything that the idolaters, according to their doctrine and contrary to reason, consider as being useful. Recall, however, that Ibn Washia himself also didn't condone these activities. He simply recorded them. So much like the Picatrix, Maimonides makes no mention of this impartiality. What this likely indicates, though, is that the Nabataean agriculture was, in fact, being widely circulated, copied, and read precisely to acquire more knowledge about things like witchcraft and the actions of talismans, uh, more so than the reasons what, that the author intended, which is to preserve the wisdom of his ancestors. This was, after all, what the author of the Gayat al-Hakim used it for. So, uh, going on with what uh, Maimonides said. It is further mentioned in the Nabataean agriculture that the ancient idolaters caused certain things named in that work to rot, waited until the sun stood in a certain degree of the ecliptic, and then they performed many acts of witchcraft. They believed that substance should be kept ready by everyone, uh, that that substance rather, and when a fruit tree is planted, a portion of that rotten substance should be scattered around the tree or under it. The tree would then grow quicker and produce more fruit than is generally the case. They say that this process is very extraordinary. It acts like a talisman and is more efficient than any kind of witchcraft in accelerating the productiveness of fruit trees. I have already shown and explained to you how the law opposes all kinds of witchcraft. The law, therefore, prohibits us to use the fruit yielded by a tree in the first three years after it has been planted, so that there should be no opportunity for accelerating, according to their imagination, the productiveness of any tree. So this kind of ties into Maimonides' larger project, which is explaining some of the halakhic laws that perhaps they don't seem so clear on the surface. Why do we not eat pork? Why do we not mix fabric? Something like that. Maimonides' project was to explain why it is that many laws are the way that they are. And one of the things that he wanted people to know was that many laws are actually against idolatry and against magic that the Nabataeans would practice in their agricultural um, practices. So, going on. After three years, most fruit trees in Palestine yield fruit by the ordinary course of nature without the application of those magical performances. Another belief, which was very common in those days and survived among the Sabians, is this. When a tree is grafted into another in the time of a certain conjunction of the sun and the moon and is fumigated with certain substances while a formula is uttered, that tree will produce a thing that will be found exceedingly useful. More general than anything mentioned by the heathen writers was the ceremony of grafting an olive branch upon a lemon tree as described in the beginning of the Nabataean agriculture. They also said that when one species is grafted on another, the branch which is to be grafted must be in the hand of a beautiful damsel, whilst the male person has disgraceful and unnatural sexual intercourse with her. During that intercourse, the woman grafts the branch into the tree the law, therefore, prohibits us to mix different species together, 
that is, to graft one tree into another, because we must keep away from the opinions of idolaters and the abominations of their unnatural sexual intercourse. In order to guard against the grafting of trees, we are forbidden to sow any two kinds of seed together or near each other. Uh, when you study the traditional explanation of this precept, you will find that the prohibition of grafting, the principal element in this commandment, holds good for all countries and is punishable by 40 stripes. But the sowing of seeds one near the other is only prohibited in Palestine. In the Nabataean agriculture, it is further distinctly stated that it was the custom of the people in those days to sow barley and stones of grapes together, in the belief that the vineyard could only prosper in this way. Therefore, the law prohibits us to use seeds that has grown in a vineyard, that commands us to burn both the barley and the produce of the vineyard. Oh, sorry, and commands us. For, for the practice of the heathen, which they considered as magic and talismanic, even if not containing any idolatrous elements, are prohibited, as we have stated above in the reference to the dictum of our sages, we must not hang upon the tree the fetus of an animal belonging to the sanctuary. The law prohibits all heathen customs called by our sages the ways of the Amorite, because they are connected with idolatry. They believe that all these practices are magic charms of great efficiency in agriculture. Thus, those practices lead to the worship of the stars, and therefore all practices of those nations have been prohibited. So in this extensive passage, we can see how ancient or not, the kinds of ritual discussed by the Nabataean agricultural agriculture actually created a kind of polemical springboard for the Rambam to discuss the reasons why he hated the practices of the ancient pagans and gave certain prohibitions which seem absurd on the surface. Because aside from being lewd or superstitious, they led to the worship of creation rather than of the creator. Maimonides wrote a lot more on this issue, but I don't want to drown everyone in more text than I already have. So if this is interesting to you, um, I have a reading of Maimonides' chapter dealing with the Sabians on my YouTube channel, The Modern Hermeticist, and you can check that out later. So apart from the excerpts in the Picatrix, the only other medieval references I could find to the Nabataean agriculture in the European Latin West was in the works of Enrique de Vilena, a Spanish theologian who has a character Abenaxia or Abenexia, and it describes his book, the Philaha uh, Chiaptia Mayor or Abenoaxia's Philahatia, which means the Chaldean agriculture, based on the original Arabic title, the Al Philaha Al Nabatia. So my source for this is uh, George Darby's 1941 article, Ibn Wishia in Medieval Spanish Literature. And there really hasn't been anything written since then about Ibn Wishia in Latin literature. Uh, long after the Middle Ages, Athanasius Kircher, the 17th century Jesuit orientalist and author of Oedipus Aegyptiacus, took interest in Ibn Wishia as a translator of hieroglyphs, but chiefly through a pseudepigraphically attributed work, which I'll come back to at the end if we have time. So what did the Picatrix hold as important in the Nabataean agriculture? Well, first and foremost, it seems as if, along with the epistles of the Brethren of Purity, the Nabataean agriculture served in some ways as a model text to the author of the Kayat al-Hakim, at least insofar as it is an encyclopedic compendium of ancient sources drawn from various nations sensitive to the practical dimensions of pagan or pre-Islamic magic. Picatrix also in part derives its quasi-anthropological approach to the ancient sages of all nations from the Nabataean agriculture. It treats the sages of different natures, nations each on their own merits, that is to say, it says that some nations are better than others at certain arts, and in this way, the Picatrix bears a lot of similarities to the Nabataean agriculture. But other than this rather tenuous connection, there are four elements in particular that I think the author of the Hayat al-Hakim, or Picatrix, 
most prominently took to be important. And we'll come back to touch on each of these in order. The first is a sense of deep time or deep antiquity, that the world was far more ancient than we could know, and that the past contained many more secrets than were possible to relate. Uh, next, we have a veneration and a respect for sages, in particular, the three sages who assembled the Nabataean agriculture. Third, we have practical accounts of ancient Chaldean planetary prayers. And lastly, the author of the Picatrix held the Nabataean agriculture to be an invaluable source of ancient folklore, especially ethnobotanical folklore, that is to say things like myths about divine trees and plants and the relationship between the astral world, the vegetable world, and the human world, though this as much included knowledge of poisons as it did of foods and medicines. So the first point, deep antiquity. Um, while most of the sources that comprise the Nabataean agriculture were not that ancient, they were mostly from late antiquity, they demonstrate that in late antiquity, there endured a concern for a deep past that stretched back through the Bronze Age and on into legend and myth. Part, you know, pagan mythology and part biblical mythology. These blend together rather seamlessly. Um, but this span of time was calculable via astrological cycles. So Ibn Washia claimed that the text that he was translating was the work of three Kasdanian wise men who wrote it over the span of 20,000 years. This is a span of time that Yako Hemi Nantella advises us to take symbolically. The local Mesopotamian tradition was that there were men that existed before Adam, and that Adam was one planetary prophet among many, but there were other prophets before him. So he's the father of all mankind, he's the first man, but he's also not the first man. It's, it's this very interesting, bizarro world where everything is similar, but not quite the same. It's just different enough to, to throw a wrench in what you would expect from these kinds of sages. So Ibn Washia was, not, uh, was a translator. He was not a forger or an inventor of new materials. That's, that's an important thing to get because it wasn't always the case. Uh, among 19th century Orientalists, people thought that Ibn Washia was a forger of information. And a lot of people who studied his stuff, they were trying to figure out if he was um, really conveying information from ancient Babylon. And when people realized that most of his information was from late antiquity, they dumped him like a sack of potatoes because they were like, who cares about late antiquity? We only care about the Bronze Age and the stuff that was going on during the Bible times and so forth. So uh, there's been a resurgence in, in interest in Ibn Washia because we, we take for granted that he is a translator and not some forger or inventor of new material. In keeping with this claim, the Picatrix clearly passed along the idea that though there were many sages mentioned in the Nabataean agriculture, there were three sages in particular who were responsible for assembling it. Though, as far as I can gather, the Picatrix only mentions one of these three sages by name, unless we are to also include Ibn Washia among their ranks, which I believe would be an error. So from among the sages of the Nabataean agriculture, we find in the Picatrix only the mysterious Zeherit, sometimes translated as Seherit or Cheherit, depending on how you want to do your Cs. This Zeherit or Seherit, Cheherit, whatever figure is most certainly Sagrit, the first alleged author of the Nabataean agriculture in its ancient Syriac original. It was this original text, according to Ibn Washia's own introduction, that was first expanded by a sage named Yan Bushad, a pagan monotheist, whatever that means, and then given its final shape by Kutama, a late antique pagan, but possibly even a literary device invented by Ibn Washia. Kutama is not exactly, you know, it sounds like Gautama, but it's not a name that is Nabataean or ancient in any way. There's no other attestation of that name. So these are the other two sages responsible for writing the Nabataean agriculture. 
but neither of them are named explicitly in the Latin Picatrix, uh, but they are alluded to in this passage about the three sages that composed the Liber al Filaha. Uh, so in Picatrix 124, it states, know that magic is performed through works and deeds, but also through other subtle means. Indeed, the magic accomplished through works and deeds emerges emerges from the disciplines that the sage of the world the sages of the world carry out below the cycle of the moon, as one sage said in the Liber al Filaha, wherein it is written to trap four birds. So note how the discussion on magic is here given tangentially to a discussion on hunting fowl. The part of magic acquired from subtle means, however comes from the works written by that sage who worked under the movements of the cycle of Saturn, and so too from the writings of that wise man who worked under the movements of the cycle of Venus. Both these wise men wrote in this Liber al Filaha. Now, I'd like everyone to note that there are many other sages in the Nabataean agriculture that are not mentioned in the Picatrix as well. Uh, Tamara Karbash, Tamitra the Canaanite, Jan Bouchad the Long Silent, etc. The prophet Adam is one such figure who appears in the Picatrix, but he's not one of the three sages who composed the Nabataean agriculture. Now, this Adam can only in some ways be equated with the biblical first man or the father of all humankind, since there were other sages who came before him, like Kamas an Nahri and Shamat an Nahri, and so on. Nevertheless, this identification of this prophet with some version of the Adam from the Bible is confirmed by the fact that his son is named Seth and the father of all Sethians, which is a group that the author views with some disdain. And I think that bears mentioning. Now, if we compare the Picatrix 124 passage from the previous slide with a later quote in section 383, we can confirm from the Picatrix alone that Zeherit or Sagrit was understood by the Picatrix's author to have been the sage who lived and wrote many millennia before his own time, namely during a Saturnine cycle. It was Zeherit, therefore, and not Ibn Washia, who is explicitly cited in the Picatrix as the author conveying one of the more controversial rituals in the work, the, the prayer to Saturn, for example. The Latin Picatrix is perfectly clear in distinguishing between when Zeherit, the first of the three sages in the Nabataean agriculture, is speaking, and when Ibn Wishia takes center stage, the man who wrote these words in the Chaldean agriculture, which he translated from the Chaldean tongue. While not being terribly specific as to the nature and identity of all the sages of the Nabataean agriculture, they at least were not all muddled together into a single author by the Picatrix, and that's a fact that demonstrates quite a close familiarity with the book. So let's see what Ibn Washia himself said about this, since he gave a lot more details and we should be able to um, get a better sense of the Picatrix passage after reading this one. So this is what he says. I found out that this book of agriculture is attributed to three ancient Kasdanian sages. They say that one of them began it, the second added other things to it, and the third made it complete. Concerning one who began this, it is said that he was a man who appeared in the seventh millennium of the 7,000 years of Saturn. That is the millennium in which Saturn was in partnership with the moon. His name was Sagrath. The one who added other things was a man who appeared at the end of these millennia, and his name was Yanbushad. And the third, who made it complete, was a man who appeared after 4,000 years had elapsed from the cycle of the sun in this cycle. I mean the cycle which belonged to Saturn, that is, the thousand years in which the two earlier men had appeared. I counted the interval between the two times, and it came out to be 21,000 years. The name of this third man was Kutama. He said that he appeared after 4,000 years had elapsed from the cycle of the sun which lasts for 7,000 years. So between them, there was a period which I have mentioned. Both of the two who added to what the first, Sagrit, had composed, added in their books something to every chapter, which Sagrit had written, but they changed nothing from what he had said and written and spoken about the things that he mentioned. 
nor did they alter uh, the order in which he presented his material. They merely added everything that he added to everything that he had put down. So the beginning and the preface of the book are by Sagrit or Zeherit, if you will. So the three stages of the Nab Nabataean agriculture. For Ibn Washia, um, the reasons behind why such ancient writings as those of Sagrit needed to be preserved were simple and well-meaning. People in his own day had become, to use his own words, like dumb animals when compared with the wisdom of his ancient ancestors, and this wish to impart some of their science to them so that they might stop defaming the Nabataeans and would awaken from their sleep and would be resurrected for a while from their death of ignorance. So in this introduction, Ibn Washia asked, what use does a man have of books which are hidden and unattainable to him so that he cannot read them nor learn from them? They are no more valuable to him than stones and mud bricks. So he was really doing this kind of alchemical process of turning these Arabic bricks that nobody could read in, or these uh, Nabataean bricks that nobody could read into Arabic. And uh, from there, they spread throughout the world. And we are here a thousand years talking about them. When it came to transmitting Zeherit or Zagrit's teachings, however, he made it clear that, quote, I do not dare to argue against Sagrit. Nay, I refrain from that due to my respect for him, yet I believe in what my reason says to be correct, even when it does contradict Sagrit. For it is better to follow the truth than to follow him. So in the Picatrix, this Zeherit figure serves as both a mouthpiece far removed from Ibn Washia for pagan planetary rituals and as a repository for a number of more practical magical operations geared towards agriculture. Though admittedly, the line between these two categories of magic are somewhat blurry. This can be seen in the following operations taken from Book 4, Chapter 7, which is entitled On What is Found Concerning the Art of Magic in the Chaldean Ag Agriculture, which Abu Bair Abin Vaxie translated from the Chaldean language into Arabic wherein Zeherit is named twice amidst a large number of other citations. So in 479, it says, Concerning this, a certain sage named Zeherit, who was one of the three men assembling the Chaldean agriculture, said, On the first day of the lunar month, and in the first hour of that day, take olive branches with green and not yellow leaves, carry them home, and set them aside until the beginning of the next moon. Then, at the beginning of the subsequent moon, take other branches home, as before, carrying them, as before, and setting them aside in the place where the first ones are. Then, take the first ones and burn them, warming yourself with the heat of the coals. That person will be protected and totally free from all the evils and, and impediments of Saturn. They will become continuously cheerful in spirit and character, rejoicing. They will never be sad nor mournful. They will profit in their works and stand in good fortune. They will be virtuous and not die until old age. And then another example is 4724. A sage whom we have named elsewhere, namely Zeherit, cites the 19 experiments written out below. The first is for defending vines from poor weather. Take a marble or wooden tablet and inscribe images of vines and grapes upon it. Do this between the 22nd day of October and the 4th of December, that is, any day out of these. Place this tablet thus prepared in the middle of the vines. This image is proven to defend vines from bad weather. So these sorts of atrop uh, apotropaic images were very popular among the Nabataeans, according to Ibn Washia, but even these were not above suspicion. Uh, recall Ibn Washia's cautious words against taking Zacharyt's words at face value, how he would rather follow reason and the truth than follow Sagarit, despite his antiquity and authority. By and large, in the Picatrix, in the 19 experiments of Zeherit uh, that follow uh, involving agricultural magic, that is the operations concerned with driving off snakes, reptiles, vermin, bees, scorpions, and animals that harm vines, most fall into the category of beneficial 
but strewn among them are also a few harmful operations which demonstrate some of the potential darker sides of talismanic magic, such as we saw Maimonides write against earlier. Uh, while in the interest of space, I can't include all 19 of these uh, operations, you can find them all in Picatrix Book 4, Chapter 7. So, planetary prayers. Another fact about Ibn Washia and the sages of the Nabataean agriculture that could be derived from a reading, uh, that from reading solely the Latin Picatrix is that the ancient Chaldeans, above all other nations, were the chief authorities when it came to planetary prayers. The prayers in the Picatrix dedicated specifically uh, to the sun and to Saturn, that is not the set of Haranian prayers attributed to Al-Tabari, uh, these are attributed to the sages of the Nabataean agriculture, and they can be found in Book 3, Chapter 8, entitled On How the Nabataeans Used to Pray to the Sun and Saturn, and How They Would Speak to, uh, with Them and Draw Down Their Spirits and Effects. So, Zeherit's, or Sagrit's Prayer to Saturn for Protection from His Malefic Influences. Uh, this is the one with the suffumigation of old hides and fat and sweat, 14 dead bats, 14 dead mice, you take the ashes from this uh, burnt offering and place it atop the head of an image, throw yourself down on a stone floor, black stone floor. Uh, I, I believe it's for life extension. Uh, there are a few requests I think that are possible in this. But when relating this more controversial material from the Nabataean agriculture, the Picatrix was clear to note when it came from Zeherit's pagan prayers, uh, because he included them, quote, solely for demonstrating the common agreement between the ancient sages concerning the planetary operations and the constant protection of their bodies by means of planetary natures. He added, since this prayer is forbidden in our law, we include it here merely for uncovering the ancient sages' secrets since they performed this ritual in ancient times before the law was given. Now, whether this statement was made in perfect sincerity, or whether it was simply written out of an excess of caution and passed along with a wink and a nudge, it's impossible to say for sure, but I see no reason to doubt the self-professed good intentions of the Picatrix's author as a teacher of ancient secrets, um, since firstly, these sorts of passages in many ways parallel Ibn Washia's own self-professed good intentions in relating his material. And secondly, uh, operations such as these were meant for protection, life extension, etc., not for harm. Uh, and so I think that coincides with our author's mission statement. So, uh, what did the Picatrix omit from the Nabataean agriculture? Ibn Washia himself did not approve of these kinds of operations, planetary or otherwise, and he related them mostly for ethnographic purposes, as we've seen. As a careful reader of the Nabataean agriculture, the Ghayat or Picatrix's author knew this, but certainly did not, it didn't come off this way to Latin Western readers of the Picatrix. Ibn Washia, like the Picatrix's author as well, was a man pleased to pass on knowledge for the sake of knowledge as a good in and of itself, but he also took pains to absolve himself from responsibility in the event that such knowledge might be used for ill. Uh, magic, like poison is seen in the Gayat al-Hakim or the Picatrix as ambivalent and morally neutral, which is um, chiefly the reason why only the wise should be privy to its mysterious operations so that they can, uh, they'll use them only towards the good. To the Picatrix's author, there was no evil in poisoning a tyrant, um, poisoning a swarm of vermin or a rabid dog. There's no wrong in destroying a city of wicked men, but only a sage can know or be trusted to make the appropriate distinctions as to who should be the target of offensive magic and who should not. As we have seen above, however, uh, Ibn Washia was himself more cautious than this. And the Picatrix's author did attempt to convey some of this caution, um, but, uh, it, it, it doesn't seem like he managed to convey Ibn Washia's own caution, which was a little bit stronger, I think. So, Ibn Washia and the plant world. How are we doing for time? Oh, we're good. Okay, I think. So, 
Uh, for the Picatrix's author, the Nabataean agriculture provided an inexhaustible wellspring of materials, especially relating to magic, poisons, planetary in invocations, and so forth, anything really connected to agriculture. But it was also a resource for folklore, which I suppose was a theme of this um, of this whole conference to talk about the sorceress and the folkloric. And so this dovetails very nicely with that. Uh, Folklore is a much less controversial subject than the addressative rituals dedicated to astral deities. Though again, the boundaries between these two categories, as we'll see, was sometimes blurry. Various Chaldean planetary gods and their spirits appear throughout the Picatrix via the Nabataean agriculture, and not all of them took the form of explicit ritual instructions for performing invocations. Some of these accounts have a more distinctly folkloric Historic, uh, historical or ethnographic anthropological element to them. So we can see an example in the following. Uh, this is a, a passage from the Picatrix, which I call somewhat irreverently the account of the Babylonian tooth fairy. Uh, it gives us a window into the kinds of passages that are part practical and part ethnographical, but lacking in the complex invocatory procedures attached to the planetary prayers that we saw earlier. Uh, we're given something of a ritual, but here the emphasis is on the protection of every person within a given society, rather than on the fulfillment of a specific magician's idiosyncratic desires. So 4743, Abin Vazia, Ibn Washia, recounts how all the Chaldeans, nobles, commoners, men and women, used to place under uh, used to place this under their pillow under the first night of March, one piece of cheese, four dates, seven grape seeds, and a little salt fastened inside of a cloth. They claimed that some old woman called the handmaiden of Venus would go looking for everyone in their beds on that night to stroke their bellies and look beneath their heads. If she found their bellies empty and did not find those things beneath their heads, namely that portion of cheese, dates, and grapes, she would immediately pray to Venus that such a person be struck ill for that whole year, and they sustain a setback in all their endeavors from that point on to the subsequent year. All Babylonians used to do these things without fail. So what we have here is a kind of ethnographic account of an apotropaic magic operation rather than an explicit exhortation to do the practice. Here, the spirit of Venus came to all men and women, rich and poor, and it came whether summoned or not. Uh, all the Babylonians could do was take the right precautions and induce the spirit into a kind of Chaldean Passover, lest they be cursed for a year. Overall, the relating of this kind of information is very much in keeping with the goals that the Picatrix's author mentioned in passing along the material from the Nabataean agriculture. That is, he did so, quote, solely for demonstrating the common agreement between the ancient sages concerning the planetary operations and the constant protection of their bodies by means of planetary natures. So while there are uh, references to this kind of folkloric material preserved in the Arabic Gayat al-Hakim, there's more of that in there than there are in the Latin, in the Latin Picatrix, especially of the herbal variety. Nevertheless, uh, the texts that circulated throughout Europe preserved quite a good deal of information about Chaldean folklore too, in particular plant lore. So in section 471, we can find a good example of what kinds of material was preserved uh, from the prophet Adam, who we discussed earlier. In the Chaldean agriculture, which Abu Bayr Abin Vaxie translated into Arabic from the tongue of the Chaldeans, we have found many writings on the art of magic and very numerous things of that sort, which we are about to relate here. On one page of that book, it is said a certain gardener, while sleeping at night in a garden beneath the laurel tree, heard the tree speaking. It said, O oh human, look in this garden of yours to see if you find a tree that exceeds my beauty and quality. For indeed, none can say that they have found a better, more beautiful, more honorable, and more precious tree than I. To this, the gardener responded, Why do you say such things? Explain to me what they mean. The tree responded, 
I say such things to you that you may acknowledge and honor me above the other trees. Know that I am honored and appreciated by Jupiter, who esteems and respects me. Therefore, I say that you should honor me above the other trees and adore me at the appropriate time. I shall reveal to you a wondrous ritual that is suitable for the future, wherein you will find the greatest uses. Therefore, arise in the middle of the night carrying acorn oil in your hands. Anoint your face with it. Next, lift up your head, uh, heads towards the heavens. Look to Jupiter and say, O Jupiter, fortune of fortunes, I ask you, by the praise and honor that this laurel tree has toward you, that you may grant me life for the following fifteen years to come. Once this is done, you will remain secure until the allotted lifespan is spent. In truth, I say to you that if you have done the work, you will find it true, not deficient. Thus, you will benefit yourself. With this ritual, you will be able to perceive the honor and love that I share with Jupiter and how he esteems and appreciates me. So in passages such as these, we can see how trees, like stars, were in a sense divine. The line between herbal folklore and planetary invocations, therefore, was somewhat rather blurry. But again, here we're provided with a, a beneficial ritual intended to protect the magus in this case, by increasing his lifespan, which is a typical request for an addressative magical operation. Uh, I'm going to skip this one in the interest of time. And maybe I'll skip this one too. Yeah, so uh, in addition to all this knowledge of agricultural magic, uh, folklore, and the long lost wisdom of the ancient sages, it's clear that the Gayat al-Hakim, or Picatrix's author, recognized Ibn Washia for the thing that had won him some degree of fame within his own lifetime, namely his specialty in poisons. Uh, for example, uh, the Picatrix contains a number of operations intended to ca cause harm through poison. One of these is rather gruesome, uh, even involving a cannibalistic act. Operations such as these, though, themselves drawn from various ancient sages, tend to reflect Ibn Washiyah's particular specialty as a physician and an expert on poisons. During his own lifetime, Ibn Washiyah was known chiefly as a translator of medicinal matters. Uh, in his treatise, the Kitab al-Sumum, the Book of Poisons, he recorded all the toxicological knowledge that was available to him as it had come down from Syriac authors, and this he had done by his own admission much for the same reason that he wrote the Nabataean agriculture, to ward off the slander of the Arabs who constantly denigrated the achievements of his ancestors, saying, we did not receive any science or philosophy from the Arabs, nor moral virtue, nor any praiseworthy scientific work. So harsh words. <laughs> While excerpts of this work on poisons were not included in any medieval versions of the Arabic Gayat al-Hakim or the Latin Picatrix, it seems as though uh, Ibn Washiyah's particular expertise as a specialist on poisons shines through in any case. Even without a Latin version of On Poisons, it's still possible that Ibn Washiyah's status as a knowledgeable toxicologist could have been gleaned from the passages contained in the Picatrix alone, despite not being particularly emphasized. Um, let's see don't need to talk about this. Uh, I'll mention quickly just in passing that for uh, the materials on poisons, the Picatrix primarily draws from works attributed to Jabir ibn Hayyan, uh, more so than ibn Washiya. But, you know, when you, when you go back to the toxicological tradition of this period, uh, you have Jabir, you have ibn Washiya, and they're all drawing from um, figures like Shanak, who are uh, Nabataean authors or Aramaic authors. And so even though Picatrix draws more from Jabir instead of Ibn Washiya, that both Ibn Washiya and Jabir are drawing from similar traditions, which is why they deal with the same kinds of ingredients, uh, animal perspiration, scorpion, aconite, mandrake, datura, um, hemlock, and so forth. Okay, um, so notable episodes in the Nabataean agriculture that are not in the Pigatrix. This is something I wanted to mention quickly. Uh, there are 
uh, interesting discussions. One of them is a comp is a discussion of how the soul operates, but it's within the context of talking about wine. And so how wine affects you and why, why is it that, you know, you put wine in your body, but then it affects the way that your mind works. Um, this is all related in a very uh, complex neoplatonic cosmology. So it's interesting to see these philosophical worldview bits coming out in discussions of things as mundane as sipping on wine and the warm feeling that you get from it and how that affects your consciousness. Uh, another really interesting episode that's worth mentioning is this passing reference to Asculubia or Asculubius. There are two different uh, instances of this name. He's the messenger of the sun, the Rasul Ashams. And uh, so he's called the great doctor whose medicines never fail. Is this Asclepius? Uh, if so, and it seems like it's it could very well be possible, then it's the only Greek name in the whole work. 1500 page work, only one Greek name, Asclepius. And if this is Asclepius, then it also appears that there's a possible connection between the statue animation in the Hermetic Asclepius or the Logos Teleos and the animation of the Golem by medieval rabbis. Uh, and this is chiefly through the medium of the Nabataean agriculture's discussion of taulids, which are artificially generated things. So I'll read you just this little bit um, about the golem or the taulids. The Nabataean agriculture says in one section, they, the ancients, generated animals in the same way as plants. The magician Ankabutha even generated a man, and he described in his book on generation how he generated him and what he did so, uh, so that he could complete the being of that man. He did admit, though, that what he generated was not a complete example of the species of man, and that it did not speak or understand. It had a complete outer form in all its limbs, yet it was like a perplexed and dazed man who neither spoke nor understood. Ankabutha acquired the recipe for generating a man from the Book of the Secrets of the Sun, the Asrar al-Shams, uh, as in which Askulubia, the messenger of the sun, had mentioned how the sun had generated the generated man who was not born according to the normal pattern. Um, so this is a really fascinating thing in the Nabataean agriculture. It's one of those things that you would expect to see it mentioned in the Picatrix, but you don't. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, hidden bonus content or something. Uh, another one of these is a, a description of Tammuz, the, um, ancient God that's mentioned in, even in the Bible when women weeping for Tammuz, uh, though a lot of people in the 19th century spent a lot of time and energy on this because they thought this description of Tammuz must be proof that we're talking about you know, 16th century BC material and not a late material, but actually the myth of Tammuz and the religion of the Tammuz and weeping for Tammuz and all of these kinds of practices, they lasted into late antiquity. And uh, they had even their own local variants among Jews and Christians. So for example, Tammuz apparently in the uh, like Nestorian Christian world was associated with St. George an interesting fact. So that's, that's something to look into. This long description of the death of Tammuz and all of the planetary images weeping for him in this temple. It's a really beautiful passage and I would invite everybody to go read it. So, um, what is the overall impact of the Nabataean agriculture on the Picatrix? Excerpts from the Nabataean agriculture are interspersed throughout all of the work, but mostly they're contained in book three and four. And I would say that the, the Gayat al-Hakim or the Picatrix's highest goal, that is the goal of the sage, the endpoint, the Gayat uh, of any given philosopher's life journey seems inextricably linked with concepts presented in the Nabataean agriculture. These ideas of reaching your end goal or limit are also mentioned in the works of the Neoplatonists like Porphyry, who is of Phoenician ancestry, 
and Iamblichus of Syrian ancestry, um, they, they come up again in, in the Nabataean agriculture. So Ibn Washia included in his work a discussion which must have had a, simp a significant impact on the Picatrix's author, or at least seems to have reflected some of the loftier theoretical concepts contained in his own work. And this discussion concerns intelligent animals and how among them they must attain their ultimate limit of knowledge and intellect. So uh, the prophet of the moon, Adam, the father of mankind, and Dawanai, the lord of all mankind, Adonai possibly, um, are the examples provided in whom all these ultimate limits are combined in one person, from whom he becomes like the god of gods, the sage of sages, and the wise among the wise. He is the one who teaches the people of the earth what they do not know. Men such as these rose above the corrupting power of the stars, especially the malefics uh, Saturn and Mars, and became themselves tremendous sources of generation, quote, like the stars with which one is guided in darkness, whose brightness makes the terror of the fearful vanish, like springs, whose water becomes a great and mighty river, irrigating different kinds of fields and plants and trees. So while not exactly the same concept as the perfect nature as seen expressed in the pseudo Aristotelian Hermetica, which formed a basis for the Picatrix's views on human entelechy. Uh, this idea of what the sage achieving his goal or limit or gayat actually looked like in the, in practice is in Ibn Washia quite similar to the gayat al Hakim. Sages were humans who had rectified themselves completely whose teachings rectified others, and in overcoming the evil that affects the celestial world above through a mastery of science, they restored paradise on earth for a time. So what can magicians take away from the Nabataean agriculture? Firstly, it's that magical knowledge can sometimes arise from non-magical sources, and stuff can even arise from anti-magical polemicists, since there's definitely no shortage of anti-magical polemical works throughout history. But more importantly, I, I think kind of a slogan that I want people to take away is this MAMFA, make astral magicians farmers again. And what I mean by that is that the Nabataean agriculture offers us a window into a world where the social distinction between the magus and the farmer is not clear. Um, it's not a world of elite court magicians who survive off patronage and make gold talismans and stuff. It is ditch digging agriculturalist wonder workers. So magicians should be thought of in this case as early environmentalists. They are uh, they're they're not planting near dead bodies or polluted soils. They're they're interested in increasing fertility, in warring against pests in building irrigation systems, in doing anything that will increase life. Um, so the goal of the sage was to acquire mastery of science with which to restore the world to its pristine, life-generating, Edenic state, using the same knowledge that was passed down from Adam and the other planetary prophets, and that is to become like a light-bringing star or a life-giving spring. So get out there, regenerate some soil, get into permaculture, plant some fruit trees, raise some chickens, and you can transform the world. Uh, you can make a place of abundance and wealth around you, just like the ancient sages of Mesopotamia. Uh, you don't need other people to bring that to you. So I think that's really what I wanted people to take away from this. So what's the deal with pseudo -wishia? All right, so... The thing about Ibn Washia, oops, let's go back here, is that we have something like 24, I believe, works that are attributed to him. But these include um, what we might call double dipping. It includes pseudepigraphically attributed works, and it includes works that Ibn Washia mentions in the Nabataean agriculture, but that may not necessarily be extant or surviving. So there's a lot of stuff out there attributed to Ibn Washia that probably isn't uh, authentically from him. So 
he became a figure. How did this come about? Well, he became a figure of interest to early Orientalists like the German Jesuit Athanasius Kircher, who recognized Ibn Washia in his own words, Aben Vashia. So we have another hilarious Latin spelling of his name for his linguistic talents in Coptic and his study of Egyptian hieroglyphs. But this was via a pseudepigraphically attributed work. It's unsure whether Ibn Washia really knew anything about Egypt. Um, and here is a book ostensibly by Ibn Washia about translating uh, hieroglyphs using knowledge from Coptic. So the book that made this argument is Okasha al-Dali's Egyptology, The Missing Millennium, Ancient Egypt in Medieval Arabic Writings. And he argued, based on this pseudepigraphical book, the book of the desire of the mad uh, lover of the knowledge of the secret scripts, written around 985, that Ibn Washia was responsible for accurately deciphering a number of Egyptian hieroglyphs long before Champollion. Uh, but, um, so th this book that, that uh, was attributed to Ibn Washia was eventually translated into English in 1806 during the like Egyptomania phase um, as the ancient alphabets and hieroglyphic characters explained with an account of the Egyptian priests, their classes, initiation, and sacrifices in the Arabic language by Ahmad bin Abu Bakr bin Washi. Um, and this, you know, this was a, a work that people took really seriously as an authentic work of Ibn Washi's, but it just it doesn't line up with really anything. It doesn't line up with dates of his lifetime. It doesn't line up with his style. Uh, he doesn't really talk about Egyptians at all in most of his work. He just has passing mess uh, references to Copts as being good magicians and things like that. But there's really nothing that would suggest that he was uh, had profound enough knowledge of Coptic to use it to decipher hieroglyphs. Um, so El Dali's claims have been uh, contested by a number of scholars, and it probably isn't safe to say that Ibn Washia was the first to decipher hieroglyphs. So ignore that in the Wikipedia article. <laughs> um, where can I learn more? I think I, this is a, a bibliography of sorts. Uh, it's broken up into two slides. But I think if you really want to get your feet wet, go read The Last Pagans of Iraq by Yako Hami Nantilla, because what that book is was uh, one scholar who wanted to work with this massive book, but didn't want to have to translate all 1500 pages of it. So what he did was he went and selected all of the most interesting bits or what he thought other people would find interesting and translated those and then compiled them in a big compendium with extensive scholarly commentary and notes. It's a huge book. And um, all of my quotes from the Nabataean agriculture come from his translation. So I really would recommend anybody interested in this to go read this The Last Pagans of Iraq book. It's published by Brill and it's fantastic. And that's really all that I have to say for now. So if we have time, I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah, I think there's a couple. Let's see. 